Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of my past couple of weeks in reading. As I mentioned in my readathon wrap-up, I was traveling during a big part of this, so I did a lot of airport reading, and the first thing that I read was Annie Leonard's The Story of Stuff. She had created a, I believe it was a 20-minute video about the process of creation of consumer goods and what that does to the environment and also to workers. This book is basically an expansion of that. I had never seen the video, so I came to this fresh and I found a lot of it to be really fascinating, especially on the production side. When she gets into the consumer end bit, I wasn't quite as compelled. I think a lot of that was standard discussions about both recycling but in the problematic nature of making it all about the consumer as opposed to corporate ownership of the environmental damage that's being done. Because it touched on so many things and such a variety of angles of it, I didn't think any one was necessarily pushing at you, so I think it would have been more compelling if it had been a more in-depth look at any one of those elements than all of them together. But I still thought it was definitely an interesting read. I had not realized... One of the things it mentions, for example, is that Union Carbide factory that leaked gas in India back in the 80s, and 8,000 people, I think, were killed at the time. And it mentions that several people still die every day in that area as a result of additional complications from that. And it talks about other incidents like that. And it does make you reflect a bit more on where all of the stuff comes from. And I think it does succeed in making the point that just talking about buying what you can do as a consumer is not nearly as powerful as what consumers can do by putting pressure on companies to clean up their acts at the start of the chain as opposed to the end. So that, that part was impressive. But again, as it got into the end stuff, I wasn't as compelled by that. Next up, I switched over to fiction and read Carolina de Robertus's The Gods of Tango, which is an interesting look at evolution and transformation. The main character starts out with the name Leda, and so of course you think of Zeus transforming into a swan and all of that, and, and that's definitely the theme that this runs through. We start basically with an Italian girl moves to Argentina, and a few years later an Argentinian man moves to Uruguay, and they're the same person, and how do we get there? But at the same time, it's also tango has gone from the music of the street to the music of the brothel to the music of the hotels and the aristocracy, and how did that get to that point? So it's definitely a look at the fluidity of culture in terms of music, but also culture in terms of personal identity and what that means in terms of migration and what that means in terms of gender and sexuality. Because I've seen people arguing about whether the main character in this is a lesbian who cross-dresses or is a bisexual woman who cross-dresses or is a trans man who just comes into himself. And I think the focus is almost less on making that distinction than it is going on this journey of transformation and maybe fluidity. So I definitely think you could identify the character in either way, but I think having an argument about which is the right one is missing some of the beauty of the presentation of this journey. I was incredibly impressed by 95% of this. I think I gave it five stars on Goodreads, which I don't usually do. The ending comes on very suddenly, and I was a little surprised by that. I knew a bit too much about the story going into it, and I wish I had known a little bit less, because I think I would have been even more charmed by the earlier parts of the journey, because I was waiting for this character to hit a certain point and realization, and I think if I hadn't known that that was where it was headed, I would have had a different reaction to it, which I thought was too bad. So I think this is almost something that it would be better to go in not knowing as much the first time, at least. The opening chapter uh, leads in with something that happens at the end of the story. And because two characters share a name, when you go into the beginning, if, you, if I didn't know where it was headed, I would have associated that with someone else at the beginning and it would have changed the way that looked. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting in that it reminded me of a number of different things that I'd never seen together before. It opens with a kind of small town Italy, early 20th century bit, that reminded me quite a lot of 
basically the entirety of Lives of the Saints, except in this case it's only a couple of chapters of the book. The only down point, I think, is that there is a flashback to something that happened to a sister-in-law slash cousin character back in Italy, and that is extremely predictable. It's clear where that's going early on, but it plays out in a way that implies that it's a secret, and there's a certain amount of suspense building around that that just doesn't work because it's such a predictable story. So I wasn't 100% sold on that, but I thought the rest of it was really excellent. So after that I read a bit of a fluffy mystery and I picked up Sue Ann Jafarian's Hell on Wheels. This is one of the books in her Odelia Gray series. This is a character that the author created because she wondered why the average sleuth is either a skinny high school student or a little old lady. She wanted to see a plump middle-aged woman solving crimes, so that's who we have here. This book takes something that I can't believe more mysteries don't play with, and it has a wheelchair rugby setting. Now wheelchair rugby was originally called Murder Ball, which invites murder mysteries, you would think. So it should be an obvious setting. I don't know why more books don't use that, but that's what this is about. The main character and her husband go to watch the husband's friends play rugby. They think someone's been beaten to death, but no, he's been poisoned. Drama ensues. It is a little ridiculous, and as with a lot of these ridiculous mysteries, as you get closer to the end, the ridiculousness piles up a little, and that's always a little hard to take seriously, but this is not a book that's meant to be taken seriously. So I was amused, it was funny, it did make me think, why don't more people play with the fact that this sport is called murder ball? And have murder mystery settings. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've read a sample of one of the other books in this series, but this was the first entire book that I've read, and I was entertained enough that I think I might go and try to pick up another one or two of these. After that, I switched over to comics, and I read volumes one and two of the recently cancelled Iceman. This was written by Cena Grace, and drawn by Robert Gill and Alessandro... Oh, I forget his last name, and the sticker is over it. Alessandro Vitti. The art is standard in both of them. It is superhero-esque. Uh, the one thing that I did like art-wise is that there are a couple of points where the character has a flashback to something that happened in the past and they use the 80s style and at one point 60s style art because this is one of the original X-Men characters so he would have been drawn that way in the past so I thought that was a nice way of doing it. Story-wise we have a few action pieces. We have a bit of Bobby's parents find out that there are two versions of him because if you're following the main X-Men plots, the original five characters were brought through time, so they have both the current iteration and then their younger versions. The character also recently came out of the closet and he comes out to his parents, so there's a bit of that. Uh, I mostly picked these up because Daken shows up and he's uh, one of my favorite villainish characters, so I enjoyed seeing that, but they're not great books. They're not terrible books. They do what they're meant to do. They're a little cluttered. There's a bit too much going on, but I think there was a lot of potential. If the series hadn't been cancelled, I think maybe it could have mellowed over time. As far as I know, the same author is going to be writing another Iceman series, so we'll see what direction that takes. I wouldn't mind seeing him do something a little more straightforward with this, as opposed to so many things going on at once, which is what was happening with this. So, I mean, it was fine. Yeah. Next up, I read a collection of letters called Radical Hope, Letters of Love and Dissent in Dangerous Times, which is a variety of authors reacting to basically the last U.S. presidential election. They're all dated to 2017, and it's them reflecting on how they feel. And the letters are all written to different people. Sometimes they're to a parent or a child or a historical figure. And they don't all work equally well, but it was interesting to see the various authors' reactions. This was edited by Carolina de Robertis. A variety of well-known authors, Celeste Ng, Juno Diaz, who I know people have issues with now, Lisa C, Jeff Chang, a variety of people. I feel like that's one that I think would have been almost more impressive if it didn't have to go through the publication cycle. I think that would be something that would have been more timely a year and a half ago and people could have read it online somewhere maybe by the time I was reading it. It was an interesting format, but I felt like all of the letters are so short that I think that's something that would have been interesting a year ago or and it might be more interesting in 10 years. At this point, 
I feel like it's a lot of things that we've heard everyone say for the past year and a half, so. And finally, I'll Meet You There by Heather Dimitrios, which <laughs> I think last time I read a kind of young adult type book, Nina from Corners of a Bookshelf said, you're reading YA? What happened to you? <laughs> And so I thought, well, now I've started something, I might as well pick up another one. This actually surprised me in that the characters are a lot more imperfect than I think a lot of this style of book normally lets them, in that this is a lot of working class and poor people and poor teenagers in a small town in California where the main character is one of two people who's going to be going to university in the fall from her class. Everyone else is basically working retail jobs or going into the military. She has uh, a surprisingly platonic relationship with her male best friend, which is nice, which I was surprised didn't end up being a love triangle with the guy that she actually has a romance with, because I feel like in a lot of these teenage stories that's where it goes, and it does not. They're have a purely platonic relationship, which I think was surprising and nice to see. Her love interest is slightly older, and he was one of the people who got away from their small town by joining the military, and he's just lost his leg and he's back, and he has some PTSD going on, which I think was not super well dealt with, because there's a bit of not, not quite magical healing, but it kind of goes in that direction. But I was still surprised overall because everyone in this is flawed in a way that felt very naturalistic. And while they do call each other out a bit on things, it's not in a very obvious way. And it seems to assume that you as the reader are going to be aware of the social context and judge or not judge as you see fit. So I re respected that because I feel like a lot of these books don't respect their readers and kind of whack you over the head with the, the moral of the story. As I said, I wasn't super impressed with the way it wrapped up, but I'm very rarely impressed by the way this kind of story wraps up. But I did think it did, it allowed the characters to be flawed in a way that a lot of these teenage stories don't allow their characters to have that style of flaw. So that was reasonably pleasing. I don't even remember if that was it. I think that was it for now. I feel like I'm missing something, but I think that's because I broke this up into the Canadian reviews and then these other ones. Yeah, so I hope you've been having a good couple of weeks. I can't believe it's July already. That's insane. Probably by the time I post this, it'll be the middle of July, which is even crazier. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.